All right, let's get started. Hello, everybody. My name is John Mayer, and I'm the Executive Director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. This is week two of Topics in Digital Law Practice. Uh, the website for that is tdlpclasscaster.net. The homework wiki is at tdlp.wikispaces.com. Uh, I forgot to mention last week, if you're tweeting about this uh, or trying to follow tweets on this, the hashtag is tdlp. And just so that I'm not a disembodied uh, head or a voice, that's me. I'm um, not a live picture, of course, but I always like to give you uh, something to imagine uh, while you hear my voice. So to recap, the goals of this class are to give students access to up-to-date tech, up-to-date information about technology in regards to law practice. Uh, a second goal is to inform law faculty about the changing nature of law practice so that it can inform their teaching. Um, and then the third goal is to create an enduring resource that we can build on for future audiences, future versions of this class, or uh, folks that come along later and would, would have liked to have attended but could not. And the solution that we chose to, do, to meet those goals is a MOOC. A massive open online course. Now, massive is a relative thing. Um, there's over 700 people registered for this class. Um, quite a few of you showed up uh, last week and are now showing up uh, this week. That's wonderful. Thanks uh, if you're coming back. If you're listening to this on the recording, that's just fine as well. That's what the online part uh, makes possible, watching or attending this class anytime, anywhere. Hey, so John. The homework wiki. Go ahead. Uh, Austin. Don't forget to show your screen. There you go. Can you, can you see my screen now? Yep. <laughs> well, that's, that's, uh, that's always disconcerting. But anyhow, I won't go back over everything, but I will back up to at least <clears throat> a picture of myself and move forward from there. So the homework wiki, and the reason why I, I bring up the homework wiki again is, is I was so delighted to see uh, all the homeworks uh, that you did. Great job. You guys did a fantastic job. Over 100 of you completed the homework. Um, don't, don't the rest of you think that you're off the hook. Um, if you didn't do the homework, you've still, uh, you, know, you can still get in there and do that. Let me uh, toggle over to the, uh, to the homework pages. Um, and as you can see, this is what we asked people to do was, was to put their name under the letter, last letter of their last name. Uh, the, the letter of their last name, and then to put a little dash, dash, one, dash when they completed the homework. Now, I'm not going to uh, point uh, any, anybody out except one person because I just wanted you to see how, uh, if you didn't do the homework, uh, what could be done here. Now, the reason why I bring up Shannon Brown is she did such a wonderful job not only of completing the homework, but went the extra step of creating um, an unofficial step-by-step -step instructions for adding your name to the alphabetical list. Shannon, I wanted to thank you. I've uh, had uh, a few people who were a little bit confused, and so I pointed them to your, uh, your homework assignment, and that saved me uh, some effort. Much appreciated. A couple of other things uh, that we used the wiki for, there were a lot of questions asked that we didn't have time to get to, and so we dumped them to the wiki, and uh, Stephanie Kimbrough was um, so kind to come back and answer all of those questions, or almost all those questions, uh, the ones that she could. And so almost all of this is, is her work. I went through afterwards and uh, added some links to where she mentioned cases or had links to uh, other websites. So all your questions hopefully got answered in that space. Thank you for that, Stephanie. I, I think you might be uh, online and listening. Of course, her slides and the video was posted to the blog within hours after the course. Um, and she also uh, gave us a free copy of Chapter 6 from her book, Virtual Law Practice. Chapter 6 was on ethics, pardon me, ethics and malpractice issues. Thank you for that. Um, back to my PowerPoint. If you haven't taken the pre-course survey, it's linked through from the uh, course blog, so please do. It, it measures, it tells us a little bit more about you. It's a very short survey, and it gives us, it, it, it asks the most important question is, what are your expectations? We're very much creating this as we go in the spirit of the MOOC and this being the first time we've done a course like this. And so we'd love to hear what your expectations are. 
we will be surveying you post course as well to see if we met those expectations or if we met other expectations. So it's a little bit of that need to know what you were thinking before so that we can measure against uh, what you think afterwards. Please do take that survey. Now if you have questions, you can pop them into the question box. I've got staff who are, uh, will, will either answer them right away if they're something that, they can, that can be answered right away or will um, feed them back to me so that after the presentation I can give them to, uh, I can uh, verbalize them to Mark uh, Lauritsen and, and, um, you know, and then those we can't get to will put back into the wiki and, and beg Mark to come back if there are uh, things for him to answer or we'll, uh, we'll figure out something to get them answered ourselves. Or we'll open them up to the crowd since it's a wiki Anybody in the class who uh, could provide that information um, can do that work. That's, that's the spirit of the MOOC. So this week's class is uh, on document automation um, with uh, Mark Lordson. Mark is, I, I can't think of a better person to give this class. Uh, Mark is truly an expert in this, in this space. He's the president of Capstone Practice Systems. He's a lawyer. He's an educator. I've worked with him on projects. I consider him a, a, a friend and a colleague. He's done amazing work with uh, the legal, uh, legal aid organizations on training them in the, the use of document automation, uh, specifically with hot docs. Um, he's written a book called The Lawyer's Guide to Working Smarter with Knowledge Tools, which uh, we've linked to from the blog. At least I hope we have. If we haven't, I'll fix that. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn, the, turn the thing over to Mark um, and have him start his presentation. Austin, you can change the presenter. Thank you very much, John. And, and I want to give my congratulations to you for masterminding this amazing course, which I'm not only teaching in, but trying to take as much as possible. <laughs> um, let me uh, just bring up my own slides. And I'm going to try to spend about 30 minutes addressing the topic I've been assigned, which is document automation. Uh, giving an overview, this is a huge topic. We could easily spend a full course or two just on this. <clears throat> and um, uh, the segments of the presentation will include a, a sort of a summary of forms of document automation. What do we mean by that term? Then I'm going to drill down more specifically to document assembly, which is a specialized subset that I think is especially strategically important for law students, lawyers, and anyone else concerned about the legal services delivery system. I'm going to give a couple examples, one live actually running and showing you how a complex system can be built to discharge huge amounts of what had previously been tedious lawyer and legal secretary work. Um, then talk about various frontiers. Where do we stand in the terms of this technology? And there's some frontiers both in terms of technology, education, and theory. Near the end, talk about career implications for people that are presently in a legal education context, getting ready to become a lawyer or, or be involved in this, in this industry. And then give you links for ways to go deeper yourself, uh, in addition to the homework that John, John is assigning you. So document automation is not exactly a, um, a well understood, clearly defined term. I find it useful to think of it as composing three main branches. One are technologies that are used to assist the creation of documents. Another branch has to do with uh, technologies that assist in analyzing existing documents in various ways. And the third branch is managing documents. Once they already exist, uh, how do we deal with them? How do we keep track of them and find them, etc.? And then these branches in turn have sub-branches. So creation, for instance, I think there's two main areas of interest. One is a whole raft of tools that people can use to assist in generating documents. Uh, I'll get back to this in a second, but word processing and various other kinds of power tools for creating documents. Then there's this subcategory of uh, semi-autonomous document generation tools, automatic assembly. And that's where, in fact, I'll spend most of this talk today. But in the other branches, uh, in the analysis branch, one, one form of that is what you might refer to as disassembly, where you're taking a document or a whole repository of documents and you're deconstructing it into its constituent parts for the sake of analysis and actually to guide um, a future uh, document creation. 
Now we're going to hear from Kingsley Martin later in this course about one variant of that, so we're not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, another form of analysis is taking an existing document and validating it against some standard or some other document. So you need to inspect its properties, its structure, its contents, and compare and contrast it against some, some standard. And then the third branch of analysis, which is not really commercially available very much yet, but, but a lot of cutting edge work is going on in, in the academic world, is taking a document that exists and not merely structurally disassembling it or deconstructing it, but, but parsing it for its meaning to, to tease out exactly what's the propositional content of the document, what, what rights and obligations are being expressed by the words, what are the parties agreeing to, what normative uh, uh, content is contained in the document. Very interesting, I think, a, a form we're going to see in the future that I'm not going to get into today. Then on the management side, uh, one branch is simply um, managing the content itself, storing it, retrieving it, allowing people to search. As you may or may not know, this is ubiquitous in law practice and almost any business setting nowadays is to have a document management system that enables you to control the huge quantities of texts that need to be created and, and accessed in the course of, of a professional or a business operation. And um, that's, that's a vast industry of its own that's not going to be covered in this talk. And a, a subsidiary or, or adjacent part of that is, is managing the rights and obligations that are contained in your documents. This is what would be called contract management software. And all of these pieces interact with each other so commonly any, any one of these aspects of document automation is, is, is contained in environments where you've got others going on as well. Uh, one other high level look at this field, document management you can think of as a, as a subset of content management. So I mean, content management is a broader notion in enterprise content, content management systems. You can manage emails and, and videos and audio and, and voicemails and all kinds of content which in turn can be seen as a, a subset of knowledge management. So if you think of the biggest circle here is, is all the knowledge and, and, and sort of information sloshing around in an organization. Content is one big part of it. One, one big part of content is documents. And then within documents, you've got routine documents of various kinds, books and memos and articles and letters and all that kind of stuff. You've got specialized subsets like contracts that are actually executed agreements that have legal significance but still exist and are embodied as, as documents. And another subset is managing the templates that an organization might use, the models, the, the blueprints they may use for creating contracts and other kinds of documents. So I think it's, it's helpful just to think of the context in which all these technologies live. So I mentioned the analysis branch. Uh, here are just three quick examples of, of uh, uh, technologies that, that do this. One is Kayak that you'll be hearing a lot more from Kingsley Martin. Extremely robust, sophisticated tools that can take a whole universe of documents in an organization, say a thousand merger agreements, and very quickly deconstruct them and, and detect their, their typicality so that somebody can, creating a new one, can look back and say, aha, we, we almost always have a governing law clause and this is how it's structured. Uh, you'll hear a lot more about that later. Redacto is a new player that's doing somewhat similar, something similar, uh, where you can upload, uh, as you can with Kayak, an existing contract or document and take advantage of this automatic analysis. And then a somewhat older technology that's been around for a while but that illust illustrates this category is DealProof. It's now owned by Thomson Reuters. But this is a advanced technology that can take an existing document and kind of go beyond spell checking or grammar checking to check some of the, the, the substantive uh, validity of the document. Have you got uh, defined terms for all the terms that you've defined? Do you use the words properly in different contexts? So enough on analysis. Let me get back to the document creation branch. And I mentioned there were two branches here. One is what you might think of as power steering. These are tools that enable somebody who needs to be creating a document to do it faster, better, cheaper than the old ways. Now, of course, we've had word processing for a couple of decades now, so that's kind of familiar and taken for granted. But it's useful to remind ourselves that it's got a lot of, a lot of computational power built into it. It handles tasks like automatically numbering paragraphs, 
and cross references, keeping them current, building tables of contents, building tables of citations, etc. Handling spell check, grammar check, uh, quite sophisticated document comparison. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, lawyers would be paid good money to sit and with a red pencil actually red line differences between two versions of a document. That now has been handed off to the machine and it does a better, faster job, much more efficiently. And so you can use these tools and things like search and replace and various kinds of macros and styles to streamline the production of documents you need. You can access clause libraries, uh, collections of pre-built, prefabricated components, and just grab them and snap them into your documents. So this, I think, has become kind of a baseline for many people, especially in law, who are doing legal work, legal document work, is to at least take advantage of these kind of power tools. Document assembly, you can think of as moving from, a, from power steering up to a chauffeur. And this is where you've got the machine not simply being a tool in your hand, but a, a semi-autonomous agent, an intelligent assistant that interacts with you for the sake of creating a document. And for those that aren't familiar with it, especially outside of law, a, a familiar example is TurboTax. And that, that's, that kind of captures the basic idea. You've got a piece of software that understands what information, what numbers and names and pieces of information need to go where in a document. And it provides an interface through which the user can answer questions and fill in forms and then construct necessary documents that are properly configured. And we see this in a whole variety of, of uh, forms and venues, which I'll, I'll cover some of. Sometimes it's simply a add into your word processor, kind of a uh, word processing on steroids that can do this for you. Increasingly, there are standalone applications that can be bought or built. Uh, often this is constructed into a case management system. So in addition to managing the data and, and tasks and, and commitments involving in handling a case, that very data can be used to compose letters and pleadings and, and reports and other kinds of documents. And of course, a lot of people are familiar with interactive PDFs where you're, you're simply answering questions inside an interface that looks like the document. And it automatically handles some aspects of computing numbers and and other aspects for you. Um, a quick history. This has been obviously for lawyers who, who's, uh, who, who deal with documents all the time of great interest for a long time. Back in the 70s, there was a lot of research and experimentation, even with some early paper systems where literally people would, would take uh, cardboard cutouts of documents and, and use them to construct <laughs> assembled documents for a new transaction. By the 80s, there were the explosion of word processors, of course, and, and, and tools in them to do this work, some commercial document automation platforms. Uh, a lot of pioneers were experimenting. The American Bar Association had a special interest group. Uh, at one point, we had, I think, over 1,200 members who were very enthusiastic. The 90s continued explosion of platforms, uh, more publishers coming into the market, actually building pre-constructed content for this, and a lot of ongoing evangelism, but still pretty much islands of adoption. Um, by the 2000s, this became more mainstream. One product, Hot Docs, became pretty much a dominant player. But some very strong uh, competitors have arisen and continue to arise. And of course, uh, the web became a, a new mode of delivery. So the basic concepts are pretty simple. The idea generally in these approaches is to have a template, which is a kind of a model document that expresses the logic of not a single document, but a class of documents. So under what circumstances should we uh, include these parts of a document, put these words where, um, how, do we, how do we construct a transaction-specific instance of this model? And that involves what you can call variables. Those are the pieces of information that differ from transaction to transaction, names, dates, numbers, words, various calculations you perform upon that information. So to compute pronouns and, and totals and appropriate computed dates, et cetera. Then you've got in your document various forms of logic which capture the conditionality. You know, what, what phrases, what words or sentences, paragraphs, or entire documents need to be included or not based upon the factual circumstances and the user's guidance, user's decisions. And the idea of repetition, so if you've got, uh, you know, if you're doing a divorce and you've got five kids, 
you need to have the section that enumerates the children repeated five times, one for each child or one for each piece of property involved. But the, the combination of variables, conditionality, basically if then, and repetition enable you to do almost an arbitrarily complex document to model how it should behave under different factual circumstances. And the last piece is to put some front end, some interface on this template that interacts with a user to present them with questions and give them guidance along the way. Um, one way to capture this is the idea that the template produces an interview, some, some inter experience with the user that enables them to answer questions and specify the facts. And then upon assembling that, you, you produce a document or a form or a whole collection of them. And, and optionally, also an answer file, a collection of data that can be used to, to go back, change your answers, and regenerate documents, or to come back later in the process and generate other documents. But the essence of document assembly, I think, is captured in this basic schematic. Uh, a few differences to remember. There's the template that's different, of course, from the answers, and it's different from the resulting documents. So you've got these three interacting pieces that are typically in play. You've got an interview experience, which is the user's engagement with the questions and decisions. And then you've got an assembly process that takes that the results of that interview and runs it against the template and produces a, a resultant document or a set of documents. You can generate out of these kind of systems both editable documents that can be opened up in Word or Google Docs or something and worked with, or graphical forms that are really fixed format that are designed not to be editable and, and can be printed or filed with PDF. And then nowadays, this can happen either on the desktop entirely or in a web-based online mode. I think for most people, the benefits are relatively obvious. Um, basic motivation is being able to do good work with less effort. You're handing off to, to machines uh, mechanically uh, accomplishable tasks about documents. That helps to ensure various forms of quality, completeness, consistency, correctness. And thereby, as a, as a professional, you can be more responsive to your clients, to circumstances. But there's also side benefits. The users of these systems get trained. Uh, they learn by using. They can be supported. It becomes kind of a knowledge management, a knowledge support tool. And Office can consolidate its expertise in a single system. It can improve its processes just by the fact of building these systems because it requires deep analysis and engineering of your work processes to build an appropriate technology. And not but last, last but not least, uh, it makes the work a lot easier and more satisfying and enriching as a young associate in a law firm or a government office. If you have a system like this, you're spending less time dealing with administrivia and you're actually focusing on substance and creativity. Wide range of uses on the document focused side, as I mentioned, you can produce these word processable documents or graphical forms. You can also produce what you might think of as a personalized pamphlet or instructions, where it's not meant to be edited, but it's a, it's a highly customized set of uh, uh, guidance for a user that takes into account their circumstances and tells them what to do. You can also build applications that are entirely interview focused, which are there for the sake of just using this dynamic questioning ability these platforms provide. Uh, act as intelligent checklists or analytical advisors, help people assess their eligibility for various uh, government benefits or business opportunities, and they might be used in the hand of somebody who's on a phone who's, a, who's an advocate for somebody else. I'm going to switch to a live example, and, and, and I like to use one that's one of my favorites. This is a, a direct descendant of a system I, I first began writing way back in 1986, and I had been, as John mentioned, I, I think I, I had been a uh, poverty lawyer, a legal services lawyer, and a law school clinical teacher. <clears throat> and one of the areas I practiced in was eviction defense work. And a typical case would involve some, some tenant coming to our office with a complaint in their hands being evicted and needing to file a response in the court, an answer, uh, often on very short notice. And as a Massachusetts eviction defense lawyer, there was a whole raft of, of, of defenses and claims available to us to have, help slow down the process. Uh, and so I would sit down and, and, and on a yellow pad sketch out my, my document. This was even in the days before word processing for, for lawyers. And um, hand it to my secretary. We'd go back and forth a few times and probably spend five or six hours together producing the package of documents needed. 
So when in the 80s I became aware of some technologies for doing this better, I got very interested. And um, <clears throat> let me see if I can quickly find my, uh, my example. So this is the direct descendant of, of that early work. It's a eviction defense system. And I, I'm showing this because it illustrates some important concepts. <clears throat> um, the idea is you've got a, on, on, a, a, we're in the interview, you've got a whole outline of topics. So I can navigate through and, and characterize my, my tenant's name and gender and all kinds of other information that might be important or necessary to configure an appropriate legal response. So we need to know about the parties and the court we're in um, and whether we're demanding a jury trial, et cetera. Um, what's, what's the nature of the tenancy? When did it start? What's the rent? Why am I being evicted? Are there any uh, violations of the sanitary code that have been present in the apartment that might justify withholding of rent, et cetera, et cetera. So I would, I would navigate through this kind of a system, characterize the facts, and then I get to my legal decisions. What defenses do I want to assert? So the whole range of, of defenses that I might want to assert are available here in a pick and choose format, ones that are appropriate for the circumstances based upon the facts I've entered are highlighted. So the system's got some intellig intelligence in it. So it's not simply presenting me a static list of questions and information and options, but it's dynamically assembling its very interface. It's, it's dynamically building this, this uh, engagement with me as a, as a professional and to advise and support me. And if I'm curious about you know, how a particular defense I'm thinking of asserting looks, I can just you know, immediately bring up exactly how it will appear in this context and the associated uh, supporting law. So I find this just, uh, even though I've worked with this for years, I still kind of stand in awe of the ability of people to embody their expertise in a system like this. I'm not going to dwell in here too long, but you'd work through your various defenses. Uh, same thing for claims, counterclaims you might want to assert. And based upon both your facts and your choices, various subsidiary questions come up. So the system maintains knowledge about what it needs to know. It drills down and gathers information needed. And then I may have various discovery requests. I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm propounding interrogatories or requests for documents. Once again, it's uh, giving me the options and it's giving me guidance about what to include. And then when I get ready to, to uh, compare, com, uh, compile my documents, I've got a universe of documents I can build. And just for the heck of it here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose all of these today. And this is where in the old days, and even frankly in the new days when someone does not have a system like this, to generate a high quality complete set of documents like this with all your letters and pleadings and, and uh, other kinds of uh, documentation necessary to do a good legal job uh, is going to be at least a couple hours of work. And people would typically find the, the most common similar transaction before, bring up the documents, cut and paste, adjust it, search and replace, fool around with it and finally get the, the set they want after a few reviews. With document assembly, if I click finish here, and if the demo gods are, are with me today, I get a chance, obviously I've changed my answers, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna save my answers. And now, um, in about two seconds, I've gotten my, my resulting set. As soon as word catches up here, we'll see we have 49 pages of documentation that's been generated. And this is really a, a high quality rendition of all the pleadings and documents with proper dates and names and numbers and, and all the paragraphs numbered properly and the defenses numbered uh, that's been built out for me. So I am, as a practitioner, residing kind of on the surface. I'm, 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 I'm living in the world of concept and, and judgment, not in the world of hacking content and, uh, and texts. Uh, the machine is doing its, its work for me. So let me put that away and not bother seeing it because I could I could regenerate that almost instantaneously. Okay, so that, that was a concrete example. Now these systems can be used in, in many different modes as I said. One way to look at this is sort of who's using it. Uh, you can have people that are using these by themselves. Where Mark? The system is, yes, John. Mark? So yes. just, just before you get past that, what, what was the tool that you used uh, to do that with? Oh, in, this, in that case, that was Hot Docs. 
Uh, that, that system was originally written in a product called CAPS, which is no longer a, a viable commercial tool. Uh -huh. But it's been, it's been migrated to hot dogs. Good. I just wanted to make sure that um, people knew that. Thanks. Sure. And that is in use today in, in at least one or two legal aid programs. Uh, I'm not personally working on it much anymore, but it still makes a great demo. So on the service spectrum, we've got scenarios where people use this by themselves, do-it-yourself systems that are built. On one extreme, we've got people who are professionals that are doing it on behalf of others. And, and as we heard from Stephanie last week, uh, there are many scenarios where you're, you're sort of combining it, where you're unbundling services and you're engaging both the, the client and the professional in service delivery. So you can think of traditional service kind of looking like this, where you've got a client coming in, they're not really equipped with technology or not engaged with it, but they're interacting with a professional who in turn interacts with systems, maybe in the cloud. On the self-help side, you've got that professional or somebody else who's built tools, put them in the cloud, and then they're being used by the self-helper without any contemporaneous interaction with the, with the, with the human. And then there's these in-between, sometimes referred to as co-production scenarios, where both things are happening. You've got a, uh, both a professional and a, a self-helper slash client engaging coll you know, collaboratively with tools to help get the legal, legal work done. And they're also interacting with each other. And document assembly can be used in all three of those modes. There's a lot of activity on the web, as you might imagine, from pure online forms, which are just collections of, of content, static content you can download, and maybe persuade yourself that it's useful as is. Uh, that's become a commodity. There are document preparation services, like LegalZoom being the most uh, prominent example that takes it a step further where they actually elicit information from you and construct documents at your behest that uh, may use document automation behind the scenes but not interactively with the customer. There are various websites that provide online document automation either on a commercial basis or on a charitable basis and I've, I've got three here. I can Rocket Lawyer and My Lawyer. Uh, I just want to give you a quick example of one of these that John and I and others have been involved with, um, say in, in the nonprofit sector again. <clears throat> this is a, say you're an Illinois tenant who's trying to get your security deposit back. So you're, you, you navigate to a Illinois, Illinois Legal Aid online website, you decide you want to send a letter to the lawyer or to the landlord, you're taken to this website called Law Help Interactive, which is a free national service for people who can't afford uh, private attorneys. And you, you see where you're going into a secure deposit complaint and summons. Okay, that sounds good. You obviously have to agree to various terms, make, make clear that you're not, you don't understand yourself to be getting legal advice or having a lawyer-client relationship, and say, yep, I agree to that. And then you engage in this kind of front end. We'll hear a lot more about this. This is the A to J author environment that John and Ron Stout, who's going to be speaking later, have, have engineered. Very nice user-friendly environment, and the user in this case, once they identify their gender, they become a, an avatar in the scene, they walk down the path, but along the way, they're answering questions, the kind of, same kind of questions I was doing in my eviction example, uh, and they're getting feedback, they're getting guidance, they're getting direction from a, uh, a automated system. In this case, we've been told, you know, that you, you have the option as a tenant to claim double damages, perhaps, and you, you need to decide that. And eventually, after about 41 screens, you get to uh, the uh, stairs of the, of the courthouse, and you're told you can get your complaint. And this is where, upon clicking here, with another screen or two intervening, the document assembly magic happens. So that information has been taken, it's been run against the template on the website, and it produces this customized complaint. I've left a deliberate typo on the screen here. You see it says, uh, Jane, Jane Doe is a resident of Cook County County. And this just illustrates that these applications are, are punctiliously uh, verbatim. I mean, they, they do exactly what the programmer tells them. In this case, the, someone assumed who wrote this that when you answered what county you were in, you were just going to say the word Cook. You wouldn't say Cook County. And therefore, they put the word county in the underlying template with the result that you get the double, double word county. That's easily programmable to detect what the user has written, but it just illustrates that it's a machine, it's a program, and it's only as infallible as the humans 
who have created it. So going back to the web examples, uh, we talked about all these online sites like the one I just showed you that involves no contemporaneous uh, lawyer, no pro contemporaneous professional service. But now we're getting some hybrid models which bundle them together. So Stephanie talked about total attorneys, which she uses for her virtual practice. That has some, some document automation in it that can provide interactivity between a, a client and a lawyer. Direct law is an alternative to that. That's got quite sophisticated document assembly capacity and lots of pre-built content. And Legal Genie is a good example in the nonprofit sector where the, the Legal Aid Program in Orange County, California has partnered with a bar referral service so that consumers can buy a fixed price legal service, be taken through an interactive intelligent questionnaire and document production system, and then get as part of the process a free, not a free, but a paid consultation with the attorney all as part of the same fixed price. Very innovative. I think it's a model for what many of us will be seeing in the future. And not to not uh, to skip LegalZoom, they're now trying to do this as well, offering this this kind of combined practice where they're not simply preparing documents for you and, and uh, trying to uh, organize themselves so they don't cross the line into unauthorized practice, but actually providing a, a connection to an attorney who will prepare and file your documents for you. So John asked about the platform. I mentioned Hot Docs, but over the last 20 years, there have been literally 70 or more commercially offered document assembly engines aimed at the legal market. And I've got so just some of these here. It's getting to the point where it's hard to come up with a new name because they've all been used. Like Doc Doolittle is one of my one of my favorites. Um, the ones in green are the ones that are surviving. So we still have Active Docs and Deal Builder, now known as Contract Express, Exari, Hot Docs, Pythagoras. Uh, these are all still around to some degree, but there's been a lot of attrition. And that's one thing you need to think about as you consider dipping your toe into this is, is the platform you're going to learn from and invest in one that's going to survive. My, my company gets a lot of work these days advising law firms and law departments and other players how to choose a platform. And very often it comes down to something looking like this, where you've got four vendors, A, B, C, D, for instance, uh, and, um, you, and there's various differentiators that you care about. And of course, how much you care about them are peculiar to your circumstances. So in this particular example, it, it turns out that Platform A doesn't support creation of PDFs at all, hardly. And one of them is really good, the others are okay. But this particular organization didn't care very much. So when you do a weighted summary, a weighted total of these things, that wouldn't make much difference. Whereas uh, basic question and answer assembly, this is pretty standard. They're all about the same, very important, but not differentiating. So it's, it's one way to, to kind of systematically compare. And we've, we've discovered literally hundreds of these kinds of differentiators that one organization or another may care about. And it's, it's quite a task to, to uh, distill it down to a simple answer. One thing that's, that's showing out here clearly is uh, we're, we're just showing the top of the scale, but these are incredibly close. Even though they seem somewhat different here, they only differed by about 5%. So we've got a very robust marketplace with incredibly useful, powerful document assembly tools. And it's kind of against my interest, my commercial interest, but I very often advise people, just pick one and, and put your energy into building useful tools. Don't, don't spend your time delivering too much about platforms. So where are we going? Um, the technology is amazingly complete, complex, um, sophisticated. Almost anything you can imagine wanting to do now with document assembly applications can be done pretty cost effectively. And it's a real scandal that so much of law practice still proceeds without this being in place. But I think it has to do with, with various inhibitors and peculiarities about lawyers' psychologies and the structure of the legal market that up until now has kept this somewhat in the backwater. But looking forward, there's, there's even more room for growth. Um, I'm gonna, I have a paper at the end called Frontiers in Document Assembly that goes into this in more depth. But We've only dipped our toe into various forms of interactive co collaborative systems online, where it's not a one person at a time, but you've got uh, several people collaborating around the construction of a document. Maybe a lawyer and a client, or maybe a, a party and a counterparty, or maybe several different people in a given organization who have different forms of expertise. 
Um, Multi-mode systems is another frontier. This is, as I mentioned before, there's, there's kind of two branches of document assembly. One is clause picking, where you're, you've got an organization of components and you go grab and you, you, you kind of construct a, a template from the ground up. The other is this question and answer document assembly mode, which is taking a model, a template, and, and, and applying it to a set of answers. Most people want to do both. You want to be able to um, generate a document and, and have it open in Word or your preferred word processor and hand edit it and, and dump stuff into it and then switch back into automatic assembly and kind of seamlessly go back and forth. That's, a, that's, that's an important frontier right now that some progress is being made on. By mixed initiative, I just mean where there's more, more balance between the human and the artificial uh, agent or the software. Right now, the software kind of sits there and, and displays questions, but um, it's certainly possible and desirable for an intelligent document assembly system to, to speak up and prompt you and say, wait a second, I noticed you did this. Maybe you meant this. Or wait, you, you've uh, made these following choices, and I would recommend under these circumstances that you let me take the controls for a second and go back and fix these other documents that now are, now are not uh, consistent with your choices. And long longitudinality is my, my fancy word simply for systems that survive the initial assembly process. So you don't want a document assembly system simply to guide you through the first draft. You want it to last throughout the life of a contract, the life of a, of a document. And so downstream as it's being managed, it retains the intelligence that you've built into it. It retains the knowledge about the, the connections between the moving parts. You can read more about that if that strikes you as interesting. On the educational side, John and Ron Stout and I and others have been pushing this idea of apps for justice, which is basically the notion that law students should have the opportunity to learn how to build these kinds of applications as part of their education. And that's, that's motivated both by the desire to give them practical skills they can use in their practice or set them up for new career paths where they actually work for an organization as a knowledge engineer rather than a practitioner. But it, it also provides a way to dig deep into an area of substance or procedure because in order to model it, in order to construct an application in an area of practice, you've got to understand it much more deeply than perhaps just writing a memo about that area might uh, accomplish. And, and finally, this, this acquaints lawyers and law students with how technology works. And frankly, even though most lawyers now are pretty competent using technology, many of us are oblivious to what actually goes on in software engineering, understanding the, the underlying phenomena. And so all of those things are advanced, we think, by making these courses available widely in law schools. And finally, theoretical frontiers. It's, it's been surprising to me how little literature there really is about the nature of legal documents from a computational point of view. And I've made some stabs on that. Again, I'll link to them. But um, one thing I find interesting is to think of a document uh, automation environment as, as, a, as, a meta, as, a, as a network of texts and meta texts, or text about texts. I won't say much more about it, but it's some really interesting network theory applied to the very words and documents that we live in uh, and we, we, we kind of swim in as lawyers. And you can think of various ways to model the connections between the pieces in, in individual documents and across documents. And the second area I've been spending a lot of time in recent years is modeling choices, where you're not so much applying rules to reach decision, but you're doing a balancing test. And almost none of the document assembly platforms presently support that mode of reasoning very well. So I've, I've gotten really interested in how do you build a, an auxiliary technology, kind of widgets that, that, that are optimized for helping people make balancing decisions. So as an as a existing lawyer or someone who's going into the profession, obviously you may have some concerns about where this is going in terms of the marketplace. There's been a lot of talk about you know, the, the, the underemployment, unemployment of lawyers and other professionals as increasingly intelligent machines uh, step in, not to mention machine-equipped providers from other parts of the world. Um, and we've seen IBM's Watson now excel in Jeopardy, and, we, and we're starting to talk about Watson MD and Watson JD. Where is this all going? Uh, I'll just leave you with that thought that I think it lends more urgency than ever 
to paying attention to this technology, both as a, a tool for streamlining and, and turbocharging your practice, but as a way of turbocharging your head as a practitioner in this new world. So this slide, which will be part of the slides made available after the session, just gives you links to a variety of websites. Some of these, John, is included in your homework. These are our big commercial um, corporate law firms that, that provide free online document assembly for clients and pro prospects of theirs. And they're great illustrations of the power uh, of the tools that are out there. Um, and you can also download actual software to create these for free from at least three or four of the vendors. Play with it, learn it, understand it, see whether it's useful to you. Uh, the writings I mentioned, this Current Frontiers piece is from 2007. I think it's still pretty Frontier-esque. Um, that's available on, under this link. I recently had a short piece called Dancing in the Cloud, which talked about this collaborative uh, um, form of document assembly and documents built for two and uh, collaborative deliberation. The book John mentioned. And we read, I, was, I was an editor of a recent book called Educating the Digital Lawyer, which is a look at this from the, from the legal education context. Last slide is, is just links more about me. If you want to follow me or read about me, uh, you can go there. John. Mark. <laughs> Mark, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Here we have uh, lots of questions uh, popping in, um, and we have uh, time for uh, a few of them. Um, uh, and so I'll just uh, run through these. Uh, okay. First one. Do any uh, do any you know of any document automation tools that work with uh, Open Office or LibreOffice? Uh, I actually don't. Not not that are really you know very sophisticated. I mean, there's some there's some efforts I've heard about to do open source document automation platforms, but I I can't cite any. Yeah, I don't I don't know of any either. And I've been I've been looking hard for a while. Um, um, there isn't a lot of work that I know of in in open source in this space. Is that pretty much your uh, your, your observation as well? Yep, that's been my observation. Do any of these uh, document creation programs work on uh, tablets as well as the desktop or laptops? Um, um, yeah, uh, well, certainly if, if if your tablet supports a browser, you can get to many of these as a user. Mm -hmm. um, some some of them have forms of online authoring as well, so you can do some template creation as well as template utilization. Uh, but that's that's a frontier. A lot of a lot of the vendors I think are aware of and anxious to, to cross quickly. So uh, we're going to see rapid developments in the next few years on the tablets and and smartphones for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question that was top near uh, entered in near the top. What about Max? Um, my, my my suspicion is that for a long time law firms were PC or Windows centric, although that's changing, mm -hmm. um, and that. Um, and that the, the new raft of document assembly announcements that I saw a couple weeks ago um, from uh, Rocket Matter and uh, Clio were web-based, and so therefore browser-based, and, and so right. the operating system is becoming less of an issue, at least in the new, uh, the new cycle of, uh, of entries. That's right. Although some of the main players, like Hot Docs, still remains, you know, if you want to author, you need to be in Windows. So. Uh -huh. uh, for, for many years, I was running a, a parallel version of Windows on my MacBook in order, <laughs> in order to accomplish that. Yep, yep, I could see. Which document assembly platforms master as well non-English documents? Uh, the example here is in German. Yeah, I think, John, the answer there is almost all do now. Most support Unicode, so they've become almost language independent. Uh, uh -huh. As far as being able to handle documents in any language, and increasingly to have the interface itself uh, be expressed in, in any uh, localized language. Cool. Are state and federal courts using document creators? Yeah, for it's, sure. Uh, feel free to answer that yourself. I, I know that there are court assistance offices that are creating automated uh, uh, document front ends uh, using using A to J, A to J author for uh, self-represented litigants. Um, so, so the answer to that is yes on that front. Not, not so much that are aimed at lawyers, though, although um, the, the interesting work that's being done there is, is attempts to link case management systems or document assembly systems into e-filing. That's right. Um, that's, that's, 
Mm -hmm. And, you could and that's hard because the world, you know, court, as we're going to learn when our uh, when Jim McMillan from the National Center from State Courts, I think he's next week, um, talks. You know, e-filing is a is is quite a scattered and and, and messy uh, landscape even even today. So, but but that's where it's headed. Is is why can't we just go to a website, generate the document, and then instead of having to print it and then walk it into the court, say e-file it right at that moment. I mean, what, what's, what I find good about this is, is, is now we have a vision for what we want. We, we didn't even have right. that before. Mm -hmm. But, it, but now, now, now comes the time to build it. Exactly. I mean, one fascinating question there, John, is will eventually uh, e-filing interactions with courts dispense with the necessity of any kind of document, in quotes, at all? Because you have some you have some interface that gathers information uh, and decisions and assertions, and right now we we turn it into a document for the sake of seeing it physically and filing it and you know retrieving it. Yes, but a document court, is just a data transfer format. <laughs> it's sort of like a temporary conduit. So you really want you really want the information and you know the claims and counterclaims and arguments to be nested inside of a court information system. And the document may become a relevant, a relic of the past at some point in the in the court world. Fascinating. Not in the next decade or two, I don't think, though. Right. It, it, it's a, it's a, it's almost like paperless billing, right? The only reason we get receipts and bills is so that we can file them. But really, we could generate them any time we want by going to the website and looking at yeah. the order. Just kind um, of a, a a convenient format for us humans to consume the information content. Um, ooh, always, always an interesting question. Uh, how much do these things, these these platforms, cost? Um, Wide range. Yeah, I yeah. mean, uh, for a small firm, I mean, on the low end, you can you can you can get a copy of Hot Docs for a few hundred dollars, uh, and and with some investment of your time, be up and running and, and tapping into this technology. Uh, you can get tools like Pythagoras, which is a quite robust application, even less expensively. Um, and and the and the prices range, frankly, from a few hundred dollars to a few hundred thousand dollars to get set up with different uh, forms of these vendors' products. Mm -hmm. I I think the ones that contain practice specific content, essentially automated form books, uh, would be more expensive because they they serve a smaller audience, and they they they're a practice in a box sort of thing, right? Exactly. Very. I think it's very market dependent. So. Uh -huh. you know, for some jurisdictions, someone may have, real, may have built a whole family law practice system. If they've got enough customers, they can be very price competitive. And and certainly in most cases, it's much less expensive for you as a practitioner to to buy already already programmed expertise and documents than to try to than to try to reconstruct it yourself or to practice without it. So so that's interesting. So so people coming into this have to make a buy or build decision. You know. Or should I buy a, a tool and build my own practice, or should I buy uh, a form package and either edit, edit on top of that or just use that, trusting that the lawyers who created it uh, did a good enough job? Absolutely. And, and, and the buying choices now are kind of scattered and, and hard to find, but I, but I think there's enough growth in this industry that the choices are going to get richer. Uh, but inevitably, that's going to be facing everyone. I, 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 here's how I practice. Here's here's the nature of my work. Here's what I'd like to be able to do. What can I acquire already built by somebody else by buying or borrowing or, or negotiating? And then how do I customize it to my practice? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, we're we're as naturally happens as we as we answer questions, more and more are piling in, um, and we're running out of time. And so I'm going to just pick one last question here. Um, and um, and we'll, we'll we'll put these into the wiki and and try to answer them. You know, Mark, I'll I'll be happy to lend a hand if I can. Um, so, if you were to uh, build these into a skills-based curriculum, you know, would it be wiser to examine um, existing document assembly tools or or the new frontiers? Um, and and then when I hear that question, it's the difference between the downloaded install versus the web-based. Uh, software as a service uh, tools, um, and and I don't know the answer. I I think you have to use what's out there now because that's what people will graduate into using. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of a classic answer is rather than either or, it's a both and. I think yeah. I think you know courses in this should engage students in learning real world 
you know, present day technologies that they can acquire and have in place for their own practice tomorrow. But it should also cover the frontiers because that's where the intellectual fascination and the and the stimulating possibilities are most present. So a course really needs to bundle both both aspects. All right, I, I just have to grab this last question. Um, uh, how, how does learning software development, uh, how is that going to help a student going into practice? Um, the, the person writes, I understand the importance to see the underlying logic, but in terms of getting students ready to use tools, do they have to be ready? Let, let me modify that question. Do we have to teach lawyers to be programmers? It's, it's a controversial stance, but my answer is yes. I think that the lawyer of today and the near future inevitably needs to be a programmer of some sort. And we may have less off-putting words to describe it, but we need to be engaged in our tools, not simply as victims and users, but as proactive participants. And, and to be effective, to be competitive, you need to be an informed consumer of the tools you buy and a competent uh, uh, adjuster of those tools to suit your practice. So I think it's, it's pretty inescapable. It's, people can't really expect to be a lawyer in the modern world much longer without being uh, knowledgeable about these tools. Excellent. All right. Well, we're we're getting close to the uh, to the top of the hour, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna thank Mark for his um, uh, fantastic uh, presentation. That was exactly what I was hoping um, for, and um, and uh, I learned a lot from that. So thank you very much, Mark. Um, let me go over the uh, the homework for uh, assignment two. It's now linked in from the blog and from the wiki. So. Um, so as, as, you, as you did in your first homework, uh, you created two lists of five things. Um, and, and so I, wa I want you to step back for a moment and realize that what, what did we collectively do? Well, a hundred of us, a hundred of you created essentially 500 items on a list. And a hundred of you went out and found three definitions of uh, virtual lawyering or e-lawyering. Now granted, an awful lot of you found the same things. That's bound to happen. But um, collectively, we created um, an amazing, an enormous, an enormously valuable resource that we could then go back over again and maybe cull into a top 100 or a top 50 or something like that. So I want you to realize that we're, we're trying to design these homeworks in a way that not only benefits you in the doing um, and in the going over of the material, but also benefits you in seeing other people's work and in other people who didn't take the class will see your work both individually and collectively on into the future. Um, that's the spirit of the MOOC. That's very you know, Wikipedia-like uh, philosophy that I've got going. Um, and, and I hope that you understand it and, and are willing to contribute to it. So your homework is to um, uh, make a, two, two lists of five things, at least five, uh, benefits, advantages that you can see from from using or, or understanding document automation and uh, pitfalls, problems, barriers to document automation. I thought uh, that was wonderful that Mark found uh, an example of if you program an error, even a logic error into a document assembly system, then um, you know every document created from that system will have that error because the machines are dumb. The machines do what we tell them to do. The second part of the homework assignment is a little trickier. Um, you're going to visit a, a, some websites and uh, run through a couple of um, automated document interviews um, as though you were an attorney working on a document for a client. Um, Mark was kind enough to, to visit, find these places and to warn the folks that we might be sending um, uh, hordes of students there. Um, you have to enter fake information, so uh, so please be respectful. You know um, about your choice of fake names and addresses. We're invited guests there. Don't don't make us look bad. Um, fill out the forms, or don't just fill out the forms from start to finish. You know, go back and forth, change your choices. Notice that when you change choices, different things, different paths, are either opened up to you or closed off to you based on those choices. To me, the ability to program branching or um, um, a, a, a decision tree into the software is, is, a, is a key function of capturing lawyer or legal expertise. Um, and you don't see it except through what you're able to, uh, what path you're able to take 
uh, from a user uh, standpoint. So I want you to think about that and what it would take to create systems like that. Mark did mention that in order to build systems like this, you, 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 you can't just have surface knowledge of the law. You have to have a pretty deep understanding of not just one path to create one document, but, but the ability to create all possible documents. And that sort of understanding is, is an opportunity you know, in legal education um, because you want students to have a, a broad-based, uh, open-ended, uh, need, need to be able to learn more knowledge. And the construction of document assembly systems um, is, 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 there's a mirror or there, there's, a, there's, a, there's an analogy to that. So we've gotten three websites there um, uh, that you can see up in the, on the homework link. Um, if, you, if you run into problems, send us an email, but, but, um, but these aren't easy to do. This is, this is, a, this is a, tricky, a bit of a tricky assignment. It will take you 5, 10, 15 minutes for each one. Um, you know, but, I, but, I, but I urge you that if you want to get experience in, in how these look from the user viewpoint, you know, this, this will give you a good example. Um, the most likely thing that's wrong for, for running these is, uh, is browser compatibility, so try a different browser. You should have Chrome, Firefox, and Internet Explorer installed on your computers anyhow, um, or in the case of Macs, uh, Safari. You know, so try, try a different link to see if that uh, makes the problem go away. The second part of this second part is that once you've tried at least two of these uh, systems, I want you to write a couple of paragraphs that capture your impressions. Pretend that you are a junior associate at a law firm and you've been asked by the, uh, the old uh, non-tech savvy partner to check these out and report back. You know, you're the tech savvy new associate. You need to teach the old school dude you know, who's unfamiliar with technology. He wants to know if this technology is worth further and deeper investigation you know, and whether it's worth the time and the, and the training costs and the investment to create documents. So what do you say? You know, I want you to post your short responses, you know, and, and I emphasize short. These uh, partner guys are, uh, and, and ladies are busy folk, you know, in your homework wiki. Just like law school, there is no wrong answer, but there, but there are poorly reasoned arguments. So, um, you know, you need to describe and, and um, document your work, which is to say, if you do research, on this and go out and find articles or blog posts that uh, help you um, put the links to those in your uh, work. All right. Don't forget to put a dash two behind your name on the wiki homepage when you complete that so that we know that you've done that. And um, I believe we are done for the day. So thank you very much. Next week we will have Jim McMillan uh, talking about uh, the state of technology in the courts. Um, we will be posting the recording of this up on the course blog uh, as quickly afterwards as we can. It usually takes a couple of hours to process the video. Um, and so thank you very much and see you next week.